Thanks, I'll try not to fall off the stage. Okay, um, I thought this would be really quite novel to show you. It's work that we've only just been sort of getting into over the last summer or so. Uh, and we actually really only just finished uh, this particular stuff I'm going to present to you this January. Uh, sound, something we really don't think a hell of a lot about when we're thinking about coral reefs and what fishes do. And today, what I intend to show you is some really, some data that really surprised the hell out of us. Uh, when we, I must admit, my uh, colleague Mark Meakin and I really were really quite surprised when we got some of this data. Steve Simpson was uh, from the University of Exeter over in the United Kingdom was one of the main drivers of this. Of course Andy Ramf Radford, uh, Sophie Holmes, Maud Ferrari, Doug Shivers and of course Mark Meakin's from Ames. And what I'm going to show you today is the influence of these small boats, the sorts of boats that as we'll see many of our recreational users who use the Great Barrier Reef use at the moment um, and we use to get from A to B on research stations and how these little boats influence dramatically population dynamics. Now this composite photo I've obviously thrown together here really summarizes the whole story. Yeah, we've got a boat racing across the top. Okay, typical, you know, usually we're busily ducking for cover. Um, and we've got this fish up the front here, very small new recruit freaking out totally while we've got the predator looming in, totally nonplussed by it, yeah, and almost to some extent lining up the prey. This seems to be what we find. Okay, when we think about threats or in Terry Hughes's nomenclature drivers of um, shallow coastal reefs, uh, we think about the typical things like overfishing, um, sedimentation and pollution, development, uh, and overdevelopment of coastal resources and, of course, eutrophication. And, of course, because I'm in this session, uh, climate change. We've done a bit of uh, study on climate change and, of course, um, our previous talks have, uh, have emphasised the importance of climate change. But when we think about these sorts of drivers, one thing we really haven't thought a lot about is how we influence the soundscapes in the marine environment. Okay? And when we do, Typically, we're thinking of it in an environmental impact assessment context. Yeah, we're being paid to look at this, so we'll go and look at it. Awesome. We're being paid to look at it, so we'll go and look at it. Okay, so when we do this, people tend to be interested in doing things like this, pile driving associated with, um, pile driving associated with marinas and the and producing these things over here, which are, of course, wind farms over mostly in Europe. And then we've got uh, aspects like this, sonic bursts associated with uh, seismic surveys. And these things here, the operation and installation of underwater turbines to try and, and uh, capture some of the energy associated with wave and, wave and tidal movement. Yeah? So these, of course, tend to be fairly discrete in space and often fairly discrete in time. Of course, we have on our doorstep something that is very prevalent in the uh, marine environment, very prevalent in our coastal environment of the Great Barrier Reef, and um, it ranges from 200,000 tonnes, if you're a, 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 a coal carrier, right through to, of course, our recreational vehicles, which are a hell of a lot smaller. Now, if you look at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority's website, they suggest that there's going to be a 3.5-fold increase in the amount of large shipping if those coastal uh, coal port developments go ahead in the, in, by uh, 2020, okay, which is really quite dramatic. And over the last 15 years, we've seen an 85% increase in the size of those vessels. Yeah. So we can imagine that we're going to have some very large vessels passing through the inner part of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, if we look at the other scale of uh, vessel sizes, we've got a large cohort, probably over 100,000 by now, of recreational users that are using vessels to get to the mostly the inner parts of the Great Barrier Reef. And of those 14.6 million people that individually went and visited the Great Barrier Reef um, last year, most of them apparently were in three to 4.5 metre vessels, okay, powered, of course, by outboard motors. So we really don't know what the impact is going to be of those sorts of sounds 
on our soundscape. Now, the soundscape isn't the silent world that Jacques, Jacques Cousteau would have suggested back in 1956. Um, uh, many organisms, uh, marine invertebrates and marine fishes, are very well versed in producing sound and have very good mechanisms for hearing sound. And they use it for communication, threats, courtship, and alarm signals. And, and uh, some really quite neat work by Steve Simpson in the last few years has shown that it's critically important for larvae coming back to recruitment sites. So if we put uh, a light trap with a hydrophone that's playing just reef sounds, night reef sounds, uh, we get much, much more enhanced catches. Okay, so these are really quite important. And interestingly, we really don't know what the effect of all of these anthropogenically produced sounds is going to be on the sorts of, uh, the sorts of soundscapes that we see in our natural environment. So here we have the sorts of uh, sound ranges that these organisms, marine organisms, red, of course, and fishes, and uh, blue, the mammals, can actually hear. We can see from this uh, summary di diagram, this is paper within tree, basically saying, hey, we need to do some work about this. Uh, and we can see from the summary diagram that the sorts of sound spectrums that, are be that humans are producing are overlapping with the hearing ranges of these organisms. The, the question is, if it is overlapping, then there's a good possibility that these soundscapes are likely to be masking communication between particularly fishes um, and the invertebrates that are using these soundscapes. If it causes stress, it's going to possibly reduce growth and reproduction. And if it influences a sensory characteristic that's important, it's probably going to influence predator-prey interactions. Yeah? So, so what we wanted to do last year was actually start looking at this. And we were interested in looking at the effect of these small boats careering over the top or nearby um, fishes and how it might influence fish population processes. Now, what I'm going to show you today is six little studies, some of which are actually quite amusing in structure, um, that look at this particular point. And I think you'll find the results are really quite startling. How do we go about doing this sort of thing? Well, two ways. Firstly, we try and, as often as possible, use real boats, racing past experimental study sites. Yeah. So we're dealing with real things. Also, we can't always do that. We can't be racing around the whole time. So we need to record what those boats are doing and play them back with hydrophones. When we capture those sounds and we make, uh, basically, we overlap the reef sounds with uh, a, a a, um, re a record of a number of boat sounds, we produce a, a soundscape of boats moving over a reef. Yeah? And we can look at these sorts of diagrams to show that the p playback sounds that we do actually really quite, quite well mimic the sorts of sounds that are actually there when a boat passes across it. So the sounds that we're giving them with hydrophones really do mimic the sounds that are naturally there quite well. Okay, the first thing we wanted to look at was settlement, the, effect, the, the extent to which boat sound influence reef settlement. So we set up patch reefs and we put hydrophones above those and we had a horrendous recruitment season last year. So for really the recruitment season we had, which is approximately eight days in November, uh, we, um, we looked at settlement over eight nights, four locations, and the sounds that we were playing them were only working for about uh, six hours of each night. So really what we get is a pretty much an underestimate of the effect of these sounds, I think. So we were playing reef sounds from the hydrophones in this one, and we had uh, boat sounds with the, the nocturnal sound uh, being played over these patch reefs, four different locations. Okay, what we find is there's a statistically significant difference in the amount of uh, settlement that we get on these reefs. Less settlement where we have boat sounds, yeah, uh, boat sounds occurring at night. For 10 out of 12 of the species, we have a significantly greater number of fishes on the reefs that did not have boat sounds. So it seems as though boat sounds, simple little dinghies racing across as the surface, influences settlement at night. Okay, really quite staggering. Now, but how does this boat sound influence post-settlement mortality? First thing we do, we race out. Of course, we love to use light traps. Throw out some light traps, get some newly metamorphosed fishes, place them onto nice little isolated coral patch reefs uh, as individuals, and monitor their 
um, survival through time in two conditions. Firstly, when we're playing just normal daytime reef sounds and when we're playing daytime reef sounds with boat noise superimposed over the top of it. Recording. Now, if I was to throw you in and you were to not breathe and you were to sit, in, sit on the bottom under that hydrophone that is playing boat sound, you would think, oh, I've got nothing to worry about apart from breathing. I've got nothing to worry about. It's 50 to 100 metres away. So we're not talking about a super stimulus here. And when I was, I must admit, when I was going down there doing the censuses, I thought, there's no way this is going to work. Yeah? So, but have a look at this. This is really quite incredible. We have amazing difference in the survival curves for the ones that, have, that were just had reef sound here, so we've got 80% survival over three days, compared to the ones where we just had that boat sound playing, where we've got about 25% survival over three days. Somewhat statistically significant. Okay, so we were wondering what it was about the characteristics of the system that was influencing that survival. So, of course, possibly predator-prey interactions. Okay, so how are these being influenced? So, another dodgy experiment. Okay, we get a plastic uh, aquarium and we make little replicate uh, uh, predator-prey interactions. We put the predator, Albzotti, back onto the patch reef. We put five, after a 15-minute acclimation period, we put five prey onto that patch reef and we monitor their survival through time. Well, actually for 15 minutes. Look what we get. Okay, over those 15 minute periods, okay, the, the patch reefs, the, the setups that just had, were, that just had um, so this is out in the field where we've got uh, uh, boats racing up and down on some of the experimental patch reefs. Where we had boats, those predators got more than twice the amount of, of they ate more than twice the amount of prey. So it's suggesting that something about the system is influencing the way predator and prey interact. And it seems as though the prey are somehow being disadvantaged. To, excuse me, to look at this, we brought this uh, system into the lab. Okay, so here we've got a big, great big Nelly bin. We've basically got a water jacket in there with a hydrophone in it. We can play boat sounds. Those boat sounds go through the plastic and into the plastic bucket. So we've got an experimental setup where we can play reef sounds. The people around didn't like it much, but we can play reef sounds. We can play boat noise to our heart's content. Um, we can put we put the dotty back in there. Gave it 24 hours to acclimate. Then, with a short acclimation, placed the uh, prey in there, once again monitored the interactions over a 15 minute period. And here again, just as we found in the field, we found major uh, mortality uh, associated with boat sound. Okay, so more than twice, in, in this instance, three times as many fishes were eaten when uh, we were playing boat sound compared to playing reef sound. What's the mechanism? Okay, we were looking at the strike success of the predators, and lo and behold, the strike success changes dramatically. Where we have both sound, they really only need to take one or two strikes before they manage to capture a prey item. When they just have ambient reef sound, they need up to 12 strikes. This is actually, 12 strikes is actually typical for a good predator on a good day, yeah? And so one to two strikes is actually basically amazing. Okay, so something about this suggests that the prey are being disadvantaged by the boat sound. The predators probably not so much so. Okay, so take it back into the field. What's happening to these prey and how is boat sound influencing them? Okay, we get a fish and we stick it in a pot. Okay, so this is our fish. We stick it in a new recruit. We stick it in a little jar. And what we want to do is see how this fish responds to a repli replicatable looming stimulus, like a predator lunging at it, okay? So we've got a fish in a pot, and we've got a, a rod on a bungee cord, and we, the, the rod hurtles towards the little fish, and you can imagine the fish is startled. Now, ideally, the rod doesn't hit the pot, yeah? Most of the time it doesn't, every once in a while it does, and we record what on earth goes on. Okay, so you can imagine that most fishes would actually have a startle response, and lo and behold, they do. Under ambient uh, reef, no uh, reef sounds, they do mostly have a startle response. 
However, when there's both sound, a lot of them don't have this startle response. And even when they do have a restartle response, so this is, these are the ones that do have startle responses, the startle responses where we're playing both sound are actually delayed considerably. Okay, so they're startling, but they're, when they do startle, they actually startle uh, after a little while. So if it was a predator lunge, then they're not going to be able to escape from a predator quite so well. Okay, so is this because what the boat sound is doing is it's causing stress to these little fishes? Well, to look at that, once again, we decided that we would do it in the lab and in the field. In this instance, we placed the little fishes in jars. We left them for 20 minutes, and then we used an oxygen probe to work out how much oxygen they'd used in that uh, 30 in that 30 minutes they'd been in there. We did it in the laboratory. We did it in the field with and without boat sound. Lo and behold, in both instances, we get higher levels of oxygen consumption when boat sound is present, suggesting that boat sound itself is actually stressing these poor little fishes out. We did it with the predators as well. We did it with the dotty backs as well. There was no effect whatsoever. So boat sound doesn't really seem to be bothering these dotty backs uh, at all. And of course, it could be just an ontogenetic change. It could be just that you know the, the, the prey are actually a lot smaller than the predators are. OK, so here we've got a stimulus that's having a critical influence on all sorts of, well, important life history processes. It's, of course, it's a part of the sensory components of this animal. And so we were interested in working out whether it might actually also influence the way these animals learn. Now, when these little fishes, which are only about a centimetre in size, come into the reef, they, have, they come in almost as a blank slate. They have to learn a lot about the predator field that they're going to live in. And they do that in a way that's called associative learning. They have blank cells under their epidermis that when when, um, when um, agitated, when lacerated, they release a, in a, a, uh, what's called a chemical alarm cue that in very small quantities causes a fright response. And we can set up little um, systems like this. Okay, this aquarium here. We can record the behavior of these animals before we place in the fright response. We can, we can put in the alarm cue that we've removed with a scalpel from a, a, a euthanized fish into the, uh, into the uh, aquarium, and we find that it has an anti-predator response. So it retreats to shelter, it doesn't feed as much, and, it uses, and, it, um, and it's not as active. Okay, so we've got a really quite a nice little assay here. Now, if we add predator odor to that tank at the same time as a chemical alarm cue, then that predator odor is subsequently labeled as a threat. Again, it's called, it's a process that's very widely used in not only, well, in the whole aquatic uh, environment for invertebrates and vertebrates, and it's called associative learning. Yeah, so it's a way, and we've spent about the last six years looking at this, and it's a way that our little fishes learn about who the predators are that they have to avoid, and they do it very, very well, and they do it very, very quickly. So we wanted to look at the extent to which boat sound influenced this associative learning process. We had aquariums with predators in them for our predator cues. We removed those predator cues and then we injected them into tanks, two sorts of tanks. Here we've got our little test fish here um, to train them that those predator cues were actually dangerous, were actually a threat. Okay, so, uh, and we did that with reef sound playing and with reef sound with an overlay of boat noise playing. Okay, then we could put those fishes into these aquariums and we could test them to see the extent to which they actually responded to the predator odour itself. Okay. Of course, if it worked, then they should respond to the predator odour. Lo and behold, the ones that we were just playing reef sound to learnt to respond appropriately to that predator smell. The ones that we, were, we played boat sound to did not respond at all. They had not learnt that that smell was a threat. The associative learning process had not worked for some reason. And moreover, when we put these fishes into the field on small patch reefs as individuals and monitored their survival through time, what do we find? The ones that supposedly had been learning with boat sound died as quickly as naive controls that really were as naive as they would be if they'd newly settled. 
Well, the ones that had learnt with reef sound and the ones that had learnt with no sound at all survived equally well. Okay? This suggests that that learning process and their lack of learning has mortal consequences. Okay, so conclusions. This surprised us. Not su well, not surprising. This surprised us. Okay, we didn't expect it, that the small boat noise that we get, like this boat going across here, uh, from a 30-horsepower two-stroke engine would have such dramatic effects on population processes, influencing recruitment strength and predator-prey interactions. We found that boat noise impaired that anti-predator response that is so fundamental to survival, and it seemed to be a combination of stress and distraction. The, certainly the prey were stressed out, increased their metabolism when boat noise was present. The predators did not seem to do that to the same extent, or at least it wasn't detectable. Uh, boat noise also impa impacted that associative learning and it had mortal co consequences, so it could actually be critically important, at least at this really early stage in their development on the reef. And of course, although this, these studies are in their infancy, we're doing some more in the next couple of months, um, it does ov have obvious implications maybe to the way we manage threatened habitats and marine protected areas. We do need to test whether a four-stroke engine has the same sort of impact. These two-stroke engines are inherently very, very noisy. Yeah? However, if uh, um, many people are using three to four-metre sized boats of that 14.6 million people visiting the reef, many of them are going to have these sorts of engines. We might need further, we'll be doing further work to work out whether we actually maybe need to suggest that people should be using four-stroke engines, maybe, or electric engines when they, re when they go and visit things like marine protected areas at certain times of the year when the vulnerable early settled stages are actually most prevalent. Okay, thanks very much.